Good morning, good morning. Welcome to the first Sunday in March. What a great Sunday it is today. It's always a great Sunday each and every week when we can come here and worship and honor and glorify our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're so glad that you're here today as we can lift up our spirits and our hearts and our souls to sing and give praise and proclamation to the Lord this morning. Real quick, we need to go through some basic announcements. We're still in the process of looking for an office manager to uh, serve and work into the, in the church office Tuesday through Thursday, 9 to 1 o'clock. Uh, be sure to let someone here know, me, uh, Janie, Carl, uh, we have a lot of folks, Judy, just let someone know and we'd sure like to visit with them. We'd like to get some sort of resume if possible from them and then we'll uh, take a look there and, and hopefully get someone available to work in there and appreciate that. Next week is our board meeting and today is Cookie Sunday. One of my favorite Sundays of the month, but uh, I gave up cookies for Lent, so. I, but Virginia was very nice. She brought me a broccoli cauliflower snack salad. Can I put sugar on that? Am I okay to put brown sugar on that? I think that'd be okay, right? That's not really a broccoli cookie. I think I might be able to do that. But I appreciate that. And uh, open our diner this week. We're doing chicken and noodles, so uh, that'll be, that'll be exciting. All right. Well. Um, why don't we go ahead and get our children's moments. Uh, Marsha, come on down here and we'll get our children's moments going. Thank you. You brought someone with you. I brought someone with me also. I brought, what is that here? You can put that in. It is a frog. That frog was given to me by a friend a long time ago. And I'm going to read to you what it says on that frog. Let me see this just a minute, then you can have it. It says, Frog, F-R-O-G, fully rely on God. Every time you look at this frog, may it remind you of where our hope and faith should be. F-R-O-G spells frog, and it means fully rely on God. Well, hold that frog, because my story today is about a frog. And Vera, that frog you have, we'll call him the hero of the story. Once upon a time, there were a bunch of tiny frogs, and these little frogs arranged a competition. They, it was a running competition, and they were going to see if any of them could make it all the way to the top of this big tower. And a lot of people gathered, and the people gathered around the tower to see the race, and the race began, and the people were saying, honestly, no one in the crowd believed the tiny frogs could reach the top. They would say, it's way too difficult. They never will make it to the top. Why, this is crazy. Not a chance they will succeed. The tiny frogs began collapsing one by one, except for those in a fresh tempo were climbing higher and higher. The crowd continued to yell, it's too difficult. No one will make it. Why, that little frog can't make it to the top of a tower. More tiny frogs got tired and gave up, but one continued higher and higher. That little guy right there, he wouldn't give up. At the end, everybody else had given up climbing. Everyone except that one that Vera has right there. Then all the others who couldn't make it to the top wondered, why could he make it when we couldn't? So one of the contestants asked the tiny frog how he had found the strength to reach the top and reach his goal. It turned out that the winner was death. He couldn't hear. So he didn't hear all those people that were telling him he was crazy, or those people that said, you can't do it, that can't be done. So the wisdom of this story is never listen to people whose tendencies are to be negative, to tell you you can't do something when it's something you really want to do. 
Because these people take away your most wonderful dreams and wishes. They take them away from you, the ones you have in your heart. In the Bible, in the book of Proverbs, it says, there's life and death in the power of the tongue, which means we can say things that hurt people, things that discourage people. So we want you to always be positive and above all, be deaf when people tell you you cannot do something that would fulfill your dreams. And Evelyn, can you read what it says right here? Those big letters right there. God and I can do this. Correct. God and I can do this. You put your faith in God and it's something that he thinks is good for you. Yes, you can. You can do anything. Can we say a prayer now, Vera? Would you, would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for helping us fulfill our dreams. And if we don't quite make it to the top of that tower, thank you for catching us and setting us toward new dreams. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. This is my first time in doing this. Mark says I like to talk, so I hope that I that everybody can hear me. Um, I'd like to um, say a prayer for our church family. Would you please bow your head? Lord, you are the one who can fill our cup. I pray every member of this church would overflow with your love, peace, hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Now the call to worship, Luke 13, 18, 19, 17, 5, and 6. For the mustard seed, a great and mighty tree emerges. Good things can come from something that seems so small and insignificant. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to the mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for those who have faith in Jesus Christ. The spore of the yeast can leave in the whole loaf of bread. Help us to bring your people who bring hope, peace, and love to all of God's people. Come, let us praise the great, the God of great and mighty wonders. Let our spirits soar and worship this morning in gratitude and thanksgiving for all that God has given to us. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of love. Let me more of the beauty see, wonderful words of life, words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life, beautiful
Luke 13, 10, 19. Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. For she was bent over and could not fully straighten herself up. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are free from your disability. Jesus laid hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she was glorified. But the ruler of the synagogue was indignant, because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, and he said to the people, There are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on, those days to be healed and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord answered him, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath that tie the ox or the donkey in the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan bound for eighteen years, be loosened from his bond on the Sabbath day? As Jesus, As Jesus said, said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, to shame and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things, things, things that were done by him. O oh, gracious, loving Lord, to be with us with this morning as we can as the words that you speak to us this morning, may they touch our hearts and our spirits so that we can be better disciples of Christ in all that we say and do. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Well, today as we continue our journey through the Gospel of Luke, we are sort of jumping ahead from last week's resurrection stories and now we have passed when Jesus even fed the 5,000 and then Jesus is now beginning to tell his disciples all these things that are about to happen to him as he begins to set his face and his sights upon his last journey to Jerusalem. And so we come to this story this morning as Jesus once again is asked to teach at a local synagogue. One day, one Sabbath, one synagogue, one town. And this town's not even described or named for us. But this incident that's told to us this morning in the Gospel of Luke is profound. And it's an incident that shows that Jesus has a conflict with the establishment. And I suppose maybe perhaps the great paradox concerning Jesus as Christ is that he comes, here he is as the Prince of Peace, who came to bring a kingdom of peace to the world who came to bring unsurpassed personal peace to our souls and to the souls of all men and women, who came to provide eternal peace in heaven. Yet this Prince of Peace has seen to generate more conflict than any other person who has ever lived. I mean, Jesus seems to create conflict around him. It was he who said, I came not to bring peace, but a sword to create division. For whoever, for wherever the truth of the gospel is presented, wherever the truth of salvation is presented, whenever the truth of God's word is spoken, there always seems to be a little conflict. And whenever Jesus comes around, all those who, who think they're so religious, or all those who they think they're so righteous, or they, he comes around all those people who think they're always doing good, well then conflict occurs because Jesus is about to expose their hypocrisy. Now in our response and reading this morning, we see this egotistical, infuriated leader of the synagogue who has constantly ignored this crippled woman who was worthy of compassion, who was worthy of mercy, who was worthy of kindness and goodness, and she's finally rescued by Jesus. Now, wherever we, we encounter error or criticism or disillusionment in the church, the folks tend to divert away from all the miracles that seem to happen. They try to divert away attention from the worship or look at their faith in order to try to 
bind and confine and subjugate everyone to try to conform to their way of thinking, of belief, and practice. So, and if anyone disagrees with them, doesn't obey them, then those same people turn around and condemn all those evil accusers, as they say. You know, it sounds a lot like today in our society that if you don't agree with somebody, they immediately come around, oh, you're racist, you're a bigot, or you're a Nazi, right? How often have we heard that out in the public arena? You see, the legalistic people believe that they could just please God by being good, by being righteous, by doing certain works. And by performing certain ceremonies and religious activities and maintaining a good moral character. And they believed that they were sufficiently doing that. And they were so proudful to show their outward appearance. Look at me, that I have this right relationship with God. And look how pleasing my acts are to God. And the whole ministry of Jesus it seems against the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the leaders of the synagogue that they was basically to try to destroy that illusion. For Jesus came and was saying things like, you think you're spiritually rich? I tell you, you're spiritually bankrupt. You think you're spiritually free? I'm telling you, you're in bondage of sin. You know, remember a few weeks ago, right? Jesus came to his local synagogue there in Nazareth. Remember when we did that story a few weeks ago? And by the end of his little conversation at the synagogue, what happened? The whole synagogue was so upset at him. They grabbed him and they walked him out to the edge of the cliff of the town. They were going to throw him over the cliff. Well, these synagogue leaders and the Pharisees and Sadducees, they developed this sort of clickish system by which they could keep selective commandments and do selective things in order to convince and show the people, hey, they do good enough stuff to satisfy God. So they would embellish and start looking at the simplicity of the Sabbath, because we know what the Sabbath says way back in the Old Testament, that you're not supposed to work. It's a day of rest. God gave it as a day of rest. For even Jesus said that the Sabbath was made for man to give him rest, right? Yet those religious leaders, those authoritative in the Jewish uh, synagogues and so forth, well, they turned that around. And they tried to make us and mankind and humankind fit the Sabbath. And they embellished the Sabbath with endless rules and regulations, and it became a real defining point in their authority and in their system. And because of that, Jesus repeatedly assaulted the, sin, the Sabbath sensibilities. And he had unmasked the hypocrisy of all these little rules that you were supposed to do on the Sabbath. Whether it was his apostles who went out and plucked grain and ate it on the Sabbath. Or whether it was Jesus healing on the Sabbath. And this was a great point for Jesus to attack their so-called truth. If, they, if these folks were ever going to turn their hearts to the kingdom of God and embrace the Messiah as Lord and Savior, they were going to have to let go of these restrictions and these false legalistic systems that they bondage and, and, and put in chains with everybody who came to the synagogue. Now, the rules of the Sabbath were sort of like the center of it all. And Jesus comes into this synagogue to show that the kingdom of God was much bigger, much broader, and much better than their limited idea and restrictions that was imposed by all these Pharisees and these synagogue leaders. Now, a synagogue, by the way, is actually called a house of instruction. Now, it wasn't the worship temple that was in Jerusalem, right? The synagogues never had any sacrifices. They didn't celebrate Passover or the other uh, seven feasts of the Jewish season. It was just a gathering place where folks would gather together each week and they would sing some of the psalms, they would read some scriptures, and then they would receive some teaching. 
You know, in a lot of ways, actually, the synagogues of those yesterdays and the synagogues today are a lot like the forerunners of how church worship practices worship today, isn't it? And what's interesting is that this is the last recorded experience of Jesus being in a synagogue. Because we are now just a few weeks away from Jesus' betrayal, his arrest, his trial, and his execution. And this is the last recorded opportunity that Jesus has to speak in a synagogue. Now the basic Jewish view, Pharisaical view of their theology and how they saw life and existence, they saw that if you were suffering at any amount, at any level, then that suffering was a punishment being by God. So here in this story we see this crippled woman who for 18 years has been disregarded. She's been scorned and she's been ignored by her community. This woman was crippled and she was hunchback and she was deformed. And on top of that, she was a woman, right? And way back then, women were seen as weak and they were seen as non-leaders of the community, weren't they? And this woman had a sickness. And if you look at the Greek word of her illness, that illness can mean a disease or it could just mean a weakness. Now, all of a sudden, this woman becomes the centerpiece of their worship that day in the synagogue. And Jesus puts her front and center and makes her the focal point of everything. Yeah, that's what I really love about Jesus, right? He, he always reveals the indifference that he has with this legalistic system of this rank and stature that these Pharisees would always put on the people. I mean, he's always taking that stuff, turning around upside down, topsy-turvy, to show what the kingdom of God is really all about. And here, Jesus honors and lifts up this outcast woman as he humiliates and brings down the ruler of the synagogue. I mean, Jesus supersedes the authority of this ruler of the synagogue with his own authority. And he has no interest in anyone who's self-righteous and thinks they're better than anybody else. Instead, Jesus does what? He elevates the lowest and least least likely person who would be deemed worthy of God's great blessing. And notice that her disability in the response to reading says it was caused by a disabling spirit, a demonic spirit. I mean, she couldn't straighten up. She was bent over. She'd been bent over for 18 years, shuffling her feet ever so little. She walked around the community in a humiliating fashion. And when Jesus saw her, he really called her out and called her over and said, come, and she called, called her to come here. And he says, woman, you are free from your sickness. Now, he didn't even say anything about confronting the demon within her. He didn't even refer to anything about this demon that had been inside her. And he just dispelled, got rid of the demon, and ended her illness. And Jesus shows that he had compassion on her. Jesus always has compassion on all of us, doesn't he? And he called her out and he healed her, really without saying anything, without her saying anything, especially. For when Jesus said, come over here, he, you mean imagine that she, we're here and she's here and she's probably in the back row, back in the shadows. And that's where she probably spent most of her 18 years going to the synagogue, back in the background. Yet she was going to be the lady who provided a great testimony and witness to all those in the synagogue that day. Jesus was the initiator. And look, what, one thing that's really interesting about this story is that we don't know anything about her faith, right? We don't know if she believed or if she didn't believe. We don't know anything about her spiritual condition at all, except after she was healed, she was great and joyous in giving God the glory. You know, and all through the Gospels, we see Jesus healing people. Sometimes they had faith, sometimes they didn't. We, we see Jesus healing people who asked for it, 
And we see Jesus healing people who never asked for it. He healed people that were very close to him, then he healed people that were real far away. He healed people that he was looking at, and he healed people he couldn't even see. He cast out demons from people at will, and he had power over physical illness. And that power over demons, he could cast them out any time he chose to. And simultaneously, as Jesus spoke, he laid his hands upon this crippled woman in a touch of compassion. A compassion that this woman never saw or never received for over 18 years from the rulers and from the elders and from all those people in attendance in the synagogue or in the community. Oh, by the way, I didn't even mention this. If, if you think that your faith can produce miracles or that miracles will produce faith, that's not really true. Miracles might strengthen your faith, but only God through the Holy Spirit can produce and give you faith. I mean, we all get caught up in this name it, claim. You all heard or watch those folks on television, that name it, claim it ministry, where I claim that you're going to be healed in the name of Jesus. I'm going to heal you, right? The problem with that name and claim is this. It doesn't matter if we name and claim it. What matters is that God names and proclaims it. Amen? And we forget that it's the repentance. It's our repentance back to the Lord. That's what changes our heart. It's not some miraculous healing or some miraculous performance. It's the belief in the true gospel of Christ. That's what brings someone to Jesus Christ. Far better would it be for us to go around preaching the sinfulness of sin, the wretchedness of the unbeliever, the judgment of God upon all of us, the grace of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Much better for us to go out and do that than to go around and heal a thousand people not mention anything about Jesus Christ. You know, there's only two ways that we can believe that you think you are saved, right? Either it's on the merits of Christ or it's on your own merits. It's either by grace and grace alone or it's by works. There's only two types of religions in the world. I know there's tons of religions, but there's only really two types. There's either the religion of divine accomplishment or there's the religion of human achievement. And when the gospel is about divine accomplishment, God does it all. God did it all. We simply just have to believe and receive. You know, every other religious system in the world is a religion of human achievement. And those stuck in the synagogue system, those Pharisees and so forth, they believe that too. They believe that their own human achievement, their outward actions, oh, they thought that would get them to be saved. Yet Jesus continually tore apart that false narrative. And that's why, exactly why Jesus ended up on the cross. For Jesus said in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 44, to the Jewish leaders, as he was speaking to them in this Gospel, you, he's calling out to the Jewish leaders, you are the father of the devil. You have your king, but I have come to deliver you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. I come to deliver you from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God. I come to rescue you from sin and death and hell. I come to show you the way into God's kingdom where you will be ruled by a gracious, merciful, beloved, benevolent, loving, compassionate, and caring God. You know, 31 times in the book of Luke, Jesus mentions the kingdom of God in his teaching. Even after his resurrection before his ascension during those 40 days, he's still talking about the kingdom of God to the disciples and anyone who would listen. That we should all become a part of the kingdom of God. That we should be enriched through the kingdom of God. That we should go out and glorify the kingdom of God. And we can do so by confessing Jesus Christ as our Lord, Savior, and Messiah. We are all crippled by trying to follow and adhere to the ways of the world, right? We all want to be proved. We all want to be liked. And we want to do things and say things that the world approves and accepts. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. Jesus came to cripple that rhetoric. 
to break the chains that enslaved so many to condemnation and disaster. Jesus came to destroy all those selfish, envious, prideful, gluttonous, and indulgent ways. Jesus came to eradicate, eradicate all those selfish desires. For the way to Christ is through your heart to believe in his divine glory, his divine mission, so that you may receive the Holy Spirit this day. Don't cripple yourself trying to be pleasing to be somebody famous in the world. Be somebody in Christ. Be healed. Be free. Be a disciple of Christ for thee. Let us pray. Oh, gracious, healing, compassion, caring. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for your power. We thank you that you have redeemed us. Now we ask, oh Lord, that you would redeem others today. That somewhere in this congregation there might be someone who's caught up in legalism, materialism, and selfism. Open your arms and draw them to yourself, Lord. Release them from their sickness, their addiction, and their ego. So they may bend over under the weight of their own sin. That they may stand erect to praise and glorify you. We do give you the praise and glories this morning. We rejoice in what you've done for us and picking us out of the crowd and straighten us up. Thank you for your understanding and your gracious gift to us. Now help us to be the disciples of Christ for Christ that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. today. May we bless our offerings. Come, O oh Lord, and work through these gifts. Extend your love through us, we pray. Amen. I want to say something about Mark's uh, message about Jesus. I wear this cross. I got it at Cato's, and it's, it means so much to me. It's a little cross. It's a bigger cross, and it's got a little one. I was at a yard sale at one time. And this lady came up to me and she says, oh, such a beautiful cross. And I said, well, thank you. And anyway, I've got this little one. And she says, can I ask your name? And I said, Jean. And she says, Jean, that little cross is you hanging with Jesus. So awesome, people. If you don't have Jesus, you don't know where... I just praise the Lord that I have him. And thank you, Mark, for your sermon. On that last night when Jesus was with his disciples, he took a piece of bread. After giving thanks to his Father, he broke that bread and he shared it with his disciples. and said, Take and eat, for my body will be broken, beaten, whipped, and scourged just for you. As often as you eat of this bread, do so in remembrance of me. And then he took a cup of wine after giving thanks to his father. He shared that cup with the disciples and he said, Take and drink, for this is the blood of the new covenant. My blood needs to be shed for the remission of sins. As often as you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. For whenever we gather and eat of this bread and drink of this wine, we do so in remembrance of Christ's death, resurrection, and his coming again. Dear Heavenly Father, Bless this bread and this cup, which help us remember Jesus and the manner in which his life was given for each one of us. May partaking of these emblems prepare us spiritually. Help us, O oh God, to see more clearly your mission for us in today's world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My friends, these are the gifts of God given to the people of God. Feed on them with their hearts, minds, and souls with thanksgiving.
You know, this formal crippled woman is symbolic of the life-saving work of Christ. The Lord passes by all those self-righteous folks. He passes by all those who think that they're good. And Lord passes by all those religious leaders. And He chooses, the Lord chooses the lowest of the low. For this once crippled woman was deemed to be a sinner because of her infirmity. But Jesus saw and ignored the proud, and He chose the humble. The Lord sovereignly chooses, the Lord sovereignly delivers, and the Lord sovereignly will straighten up the one who has been over suffering, hurting, out of a loss, and is ostracized by society. This healed, crippled woman is a picture of the sovereign work of the glory of Lord and salvation. A picture of the enslaved, oppressed sinner under the burden and the bondage of Satan. Hidden in the shadows, aware of every moment of her suffering and the weight and the burden of the hopelessness of sin. You know, this woman was robbed of her dignity. Bent over like an animal, and she represented the image of God that had been deformed. Then she is met by the Lord, and out of his sovereign love for her, he delivers her, and he straightens up. Christ will deliver and straighten up you too. And bring the outcast out of the shadows into the light, and turn the sad and broken heart into the rejoicing truth of Christ's salvation and sanctification, and be a witness given all to be shared to all. Jesus hasn't forgotten you. All you need is His forgiveness. All of us, each day, we're weighted by our sins and the weight of the world. But Christ will lift you up and He will heal you. And if you're even bent over the weight of sin, give it to Christ. Let it all go. For today we've heard the Word of God. And you have witnessed the healing miracle of God. May you receive Him today. May you believe Him this day. And you will surely receive sanctification through Christ in Christ. Glory be to God. Let us pray. Oh, thank you, Lord, for the gift of your Son. Thank you for your teaching and preaching to us this day. May we go, may you go with us and continue to provide us the good, health, healthy, Life's gone in our household, in our homes, and in our community. May your favor and blessing rest upon us so that we may establish the word and service of your heavenly kingdom through our hands and eyes, ears, and hearts. May we continually be your people to try to be holy, righteous, and faithful, and above all reproach. May we hold on to the, your promises and proclaim your greatness of a name as we go forth and share in your light, your love. And we go on as your people. For the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us always. Amen. Let everybody repeat. May the light of God surround you. The love of God enfold you. The power of God protect you. The presence of God watches over you. And no matter where you may be, remember that God is there with you, offering his divine peace.